there's this amazing New York Times article from 1995. Why the New York Times was covering politics of Silicon Valley venture firms, I don't really know. But this is deep and like full on Real Housewives, this article. <laughs> so in this article, New York Times quotes an anonymous source. If Merrill Pickard had divided the rewards more equitably, they wouldn't have split up. And then there's another quote in the article from one Robert Cagle, partner at Technology Venture Investors, as we're talking about. And he says, today, the power is much more distributed, says the young Robert Cagle. Nobody can claim that they are making all the money for the firm. The resentment is in the air among the younger partners of venerated Silicon Valley venture firms at this time. And when they say today it is much more split up, you know, you can imagine Bob Cagle is sort of saying this a little wistfully. I envision a future where this is the case, but it seems like at TVI and Merrill Pickard, this wasn't the case at the moment. Well, now, just who is this uh, Bob Cagle character? Well, his story is actually pretty freaking unbelievable and kind of explains why he might harbor some resentment for this privilege that you might say of the older generation. He grew up in Flint, Michigan. Yes, listeners, that Flint, Michigan. His mother was a single mom. His whole family worked on the production lines for General Motors. They were falling on hard times. It was rough. You know, you think about Flint, Michigan, even today, like that is a hard scrabble background. So Bob was a great student in high school, but there was not a lot of opportunity there. In fact, the only opportunity he had to go to college, of which he was the first member of his family to go to college, was to go to an institution called General Motors University. It's fascinating that this existed. Which was a like training school for, you know, sort of members of, you know, General Motors employees, families. And the idea was it was kind of like a like a quasi vocational school to get them ready to work in the industry. So I believe he works in the company for a little while. And then he ends up getting a chance to go to the prestigious Stanford Business School. And while he's at GSB, he gets a chance to meet and intersect with someone a few years his senior, who had graduated a few years before, Dave Marquardt, who we had talked about earlier from TVI. Yep. This is right as the Microsoft deal is going down. Quite fortuitous. After GSP, Bob goes into consulting at Boston Consulting Group, and then Dave invites him to come back and join TVI. And he does really well there. He does Synopsys, the big EDA company. It's still around today. Avant, Viasoft, a bunch of other companies that you know do well, the firm makes good money on. And so after 10 years, he's kind of like, all right, I've done well here. I've risen up from nothing, but you guys are still holding on <laughs> to the keys to the firm and all the economics. Speaking about Bob and their impression of him at the time, uh, he had an almost religious fervor that <laughs> anything other than an equal partnership was just like morally wrong for a venture capital firm. And I totally, you know, understand where he's coming from here. I don't think Bob had any idea of the incredible amount of knock-on effects that would come from that absolute steadfastness of an equal partnership. And we're going to spend the next however many hours of the story really diving into what are all the trickle-out effects and, and different emotional states that that puts a person in at various points in a company's lifetime. This is the beginning. We didn't talk to Bob, but... I don't think he foresaw just how powerful this was going to be. I think it was motivated first and foremost, especially given his background by like a sense of fairness and like yeah. morally, like what is the right thing to do and, you know, fair and, you know, proper rewards for proper work. Um, and then almost certainly too, economics was like a core motivation here too. He was like, Hey, <laughs> related to the fairness, I'm doing the work. You guys are making the money. You know, you're taking my money here. For sure. And we did unearth something that I've always been a little bit curious about because people always say benchmark is an equal partnership. It both means that each of the partners in a given fund have equal carry, but also all of the current GPs own the management company without paying for it. The management company is always just given to whoever the equal current GPs are. If we do a deep dive on it someday, I would be very curious to know how the Kleiner management company transitioned from Kleiner and Perkins and Caulfield and Byers to John Doerr. But 
is not common that it is uh, just given. Yep. So here's Bob. This is the milieu we're in. And Bob in particular, you know, he's quoted in the New York Times talking about this. He feels more strongly than anybody about this idea of an equal partnership going forward. And as you can imagine, these discussions within TVI, they're not able to get to a resolution, shall we say, within the (laughs) firm. And so they decide, you know, everybody's made a lot of money, especially the senior guys. They decide to, quote unquote, and this is the term they use, declare victory and say, you know what? (laughs) We won. We won. They won. They did. They did Microsoft. They won. Like, what more did they need to prove? What a spin. Hey, the firm's kind of blowing up. The people we've trained don't really believe the economics are fair. They don't think there's a way to fix it within the current culture. And so therefore, victory, victory. We uh, we are declaring victory and, uh, and calling it a day. So that's the end of TVI. They manage out the current funds. Everybody remains on their board seats. You know, it doesn't just disappear. This is a thing with venture capital firms. There's a long tail because all these existing firms and board seats exist and everybody's got to manage them out. I think Microsoft had gone public. So at least they were able to distribute that at this point. Yes, of course. It's worth noting that Dave does, after TVI, go on to found August Capital. Yes. So Bob and future benchmark aren't the only ones that come out of this also august capital also in 2480 sand hill road like it's in one building you know (laughs) man it's so funny even in the 90s you know we joke about the original silicon valley history of there were like 10 people and everybody knew each other in one building yes yeah venture for how concentrated tech was venture was much more concentrated much more concentrated before we actually get into the formation of benchmark here it is worth lingering on Dave and TVI and the Microsoft investment for one more moment. When I was looking up what the terms of the deal were for the Microsoft investment, there's some interesting color shared by Dave about his style of investing. And you can see that the seeds of benchmark really were present in TVI's demeanor toward what they believed about venture investing. So here's an excerpt from Dave Marquardt. The venture business is an intensely personal relationship business, and it's not an industry that scales well. He says he would never consider adding a value-added service. Companies should do that themselves. Bill Gates wouldn't let me bring in outside PR people and marketing talent. That's what founders do. My view is that the CEO ultimately is responsible and accountable for everything. They are the ones who make the decisions. The VCs are there to support and be steady. Oh, I love that. I love that you found that. That could have been a Benchmark Partners quote, but it was Dave Marquardt when he was at TVI. Totally. You could copy paste those exact words. (laughs) Yep. So back to Bob here. I think he really would have preferred to keep going at TVI and like convert it to an equal partnership. Like this is what he was agitating for. But obviously that wasn't going to happen. So he's got to go figure out something else. Yep. He believes this so deeply in his soul that it is worth not continuing at this firm or perhaps even not continuing this firm period in order to realize this dream. So what does he do? We're now in probably like early 1994-ish. He calls up his good buddy, Bruce Dunleavy. He trots up the stairwell, maybe takes the back stairs to go see his buddy Bruce up at Merrill Pickard. Now, Bruce had gone to GSB a few years after Bob. And when Bob was at BCG after GSB, Bruce had interned for him there. Now, Bruce comes from quite a different background than Bob, shall we say. Bruce grew up in Texas and was a high school football quarterback in Texas, which, you know, is a big deal. He goes to Rice University, where he's very erudite. He studies English literature. I don't know any other young VCs who studied European literature in college and somehow (laughs) managed to weasel their way into the industry. I don't know how you did it, David. (laughs) I don't know how I did it either. Definitely would not work today. You were destined to become a podcaster. Yeah, right. (laughs) Uh, It all works out in the end. So Bruce had gone on to work in the PC industry and then importantly at Goldman Sachs and then joined Merrill Pickard. And in his venture career. He was the one who did Palm Pilot. He was on the rise. He was one of the young Turks within Merrill Pickard. But remember, he's a few years younger than Bob. And so Bob goes up to see him. and He's like, hey, 
TBI is breaking up. I really believe in this equal partnership thing. The internet, I think, is coming. Like Netscape, you know, it's happening here. We're positioned to do this. And this is like early 94. Early 94. You and me. This is the same time Bezos is driving across the country and starting Amazon. What do you think about busting loose out of this place and you and me start a firm together? <laughs> and Bruce is like, well, Bob, I'm honored, but... I don't have the Microsoft money here. <laughs> I'm a few <laughs> years younger than you. I don't have the same kind of safety net. So it doesn't happen at that point in time. Now, a few months go by and Merrill Pickard starts to have internal discussions about what their next fund is going to look like. And lo and behold, surprise, surprise. <laughs> the bug of equal partnership seems to have made its way around the building a little bit and infected the waters of discussion elsewhere. It's like a virus that's like infecting <laughs> a very specific building in Silicon Valley. So Bruce and his fellow sort of young partner at Merrill Pickard, Andy Ratcliffe, the two of them are like, hey guys, there's this equal economics idea. What do you think? And it turns out that that conversation, I think probably goes about the same that it went at TVI. They probably get little pats on the head. Yeah. By the way, can we just recognize... Bruce was Bob's intern. And think about the incredible vote of confidence and how counter to human nature it is for Bob to approach Bruce and say, would you like to be my equal partner? Humans have this, it's kind of a flaw. We remember people the way they were when we met them. And so as they grow, we tend to underestimate them. And it shows an incredible amount of maturity and, and it really illustrates this obsessive sense of fairness that Bob had, that the very first person he asked used to be a subordinate of his, and he asked, will you be my equal? Totally. It reflects two things, certainly in Bob and, uh, and I think in all the early folks at Benchmark and Benchmark as a firm, this religious devotion to equality, fairness, it also reflects just like an absurd amount of self-confidence. Yes. Bob's like, hey, you and me, let's together go take on this whole industry, just the two of us, which, you know, you kind of need both to go do something crazy. So Bruce is a little bit more the voice of reason. You know, he and Andy within Merrill Pickard have had these conversations. He's amenable to the idea of leaving and starting a new firm. But he's like, Bob, just the two of us, for what we do, we're not going to have enough capacity to be able to create a, like an actual portfolio that makes sense if it's just the two of us doing deals. We need to have some more investment capacity here. We need enough diversification. And they were thinking sort of about round sizes at the time. They might invest a million, they might invest two million, but they're just not going to have enough companies in the portfolio with them doing venture the way that they believe they need to do venture, you know, eight to 10 board seats a person, no investments without board seats, that sort of thing the TVI style. If they're on 16 to 20 boards and that's all the companies in a portfolio, that's not enough. Right. And there's also just like a credibility aspect talking to LPs about this too. Like they're going to start poking holes right away. Yep. So Bruce says, all right, I'm down, but we got to recruit some more partners here. So they start going around the valley. They go outside of the office building trying to recruit folks. And... The prevailing reaction, you know, I think maybe they thought that the religious meme of the equal partnership and fairness, and there's a new generation dawning in Silicon Valley, maybe being within 2480 Sand Hill, they thought it was more pervasive than it was. <laughs> <laughs> because the pretty universal reception they get around the valley as they approach other young GPs is, you guys are freaking nuts. Right. We're in an amazing club here. Don't screw up a good thing that you got going. Didn't they try to recruit like a well-known GP from Greylock who was like, um, no, I met Greylock. What are you thinking? And that was right. That was the smart thing to do was not to go do something crazy. It was to do the John Doerr path. Like if people had ambition, if young folks had ambition, it was like, hey, I'll put my time in and like, look at John. It worked for him. He was still quite young at this point in time. And he had the keys to Kleiner Perkins. You know, there was no real reason to believe for a lot of these folks that they had to go leave their firms and do it on their own. So we got a chance to talk to Bruce and we sort of asked him about this time, this sort of interregnum period. And we were like, you know, were you, how are you feeling during this time? Like, were you a true believer? Did you think it was all going to work out or? And he's like, 
no, I started thinking maybe we were a little nuts too. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> but he made a good point, which is uh, their back was against the wall. They burned the boats. They were gone. At this point in time, they had no other option. They had to go make this work or they were out of the industry. This is like Michael Ovitz when his application for credit to start CAA had been discovered by the upper level management of his old firm. He was out. He was done. There was no way to go back and undo. So you had to build the business. Yes, there is no other path forward. So they need some more folks. Now, there's an obvious recruit to bring in to join them who also is in the same position. And of course, who they do bring in, which is Bruce's partner, Andy from Merrill Pickard. He's in the same building, so easy to get him. So now you got three. Now you got three. You got three pretty good folks. And Bruce, I believe it was Bruce says, you know, hey, look, we're having a tough time convincing other venture guys to come join us, other GPs. But we might actually want to look somewhere else. And it might actually be a good thing for us if we bring in some entrepreneurial DNA into the firm. You know, we've got all these problems with the way traditional venture works. And all these other folks out there are reluctant to join us. Maybe it would be good for us to actually bring in some different perspectives. And he says, I think I know just the guy, a former entrepreneur who I worked with, sat on his board. We actually went to Rice together, Kevin Harvey. So Kevin, after Rice, he had started two companies. The first one, Apple had acquired. And then his second company, Approach Software, Bruce had invested at Merrill Pickard. It was on the board. They just sold it to Lotus, had a decent outcome. Bruce thought, hey, Kevin might make a pretty good VC. So they approach him and he's like, great. This sounds way easier than starting another company. So there you go. You've got Bob, you've got Bruce, you've got Andy, you've got Kevin, the four well-known founders of Benchmark. But four wasn't actually the number they were going for. They thought they needed at least five people to have a viable firm. And so they go out and they do actually recruit a fifth founding member, the fifth co-founder of Benchmark, a guy named Val Vaden. Val had also gone to GSB and worked in venture, but he had moved on from true kind of early stage venture. He was doing buyouts, like software company buyouts. I'm thinking of like Toma Bravo and Vista, like the precursor to that, uh, you know, at a much smaller scale. And so they bring Val on as the fifth partner. So here we are now at the end of 1994. We got the five members of the band, the drummer, the guitarist, the bassist, the lead singer, the rhythm guitarist, Bob, Bruce, Andy, Kevin, and Val. They put together a prospectus to go out and raise their first fund. And the first thing they need to put on the prospectus is a name. It's quite an audacious name that they come up with, of course. Benchmark Capital. Yeah, they went all in on signaling something to the market in the form of the economics that they were asking for, but they certainly signaled it in the name. It was, you haven't heard of us, but we're already important. Yes, our aspiration is to set a new benchmark for performance in this industry and how venture capital is done. Who got the truth? Is it you? Is it you? Is it you? Sit me down. Say it straight. Another story on the way. Who got the truth? Who got the truth now? Hmm. 